Albion is a role-playing game by Bluebind Software, released in 1995 in Germany and 1996 for the English-speaking audience. Before we dive into any game of this vintage, it is often useful to look at the manual. This was often the literature we would peruse as children on the car ride home or just before falling asleep after a long gaming session and would serve as our initiation into the game. In the foreword, we have a mission statement of sorts. Charming in how forthright it is in its belief in what makes a great game, but ending with an appeal that they are open to critique. Well, buckle up, goes. I'm going to critique the f out of this. But here's what they say. Albion is a role-playing game. As such, it contains many battles and puzzles in dark, mysterious dungeons and relies upon the careful development of your initially weak characters. This has proven in the past to form the basis of many of the best role-playing games. Many current role-playing games favour easily understandable action and plots at the expense of the story. In Albion, the gameplay and the storyline work in harmony. Another distinguishing feature of Albion results from the fact that we have tried to make the cultures in the game as vibrant and lifelike as possible. You can talk with a large number of characters in the game, although not everything they tell you will be relevant to your quest. For example, you can ask people you encounter about information on their cultures, even though this may not help you to solve any puzzles. In other words, there is a world full of information available to you, although it can be played this way, you do not need to write or remember any details. At any time, you can learn more about both the world and its cultures from your conversations. In addition to its traditional role-playing contents, Albion has been designed as a journey through a strange new world. How you travel through this world, in a straight line, with only your mission in mind, or with many detours and conversations with other characters, is entirely up to you. We have put enormous effort in the diversity of the game's locations and less in long passive sequences. Please let us know your opinion about the game. Our future designs depend upon it. So, did they achieve their goal? Let's find out. We play as Tom Driscoll, a shuttle pilot aboard the spaceship Toronto belonging to the Megacorp DDT. I'm um, not sure if that was meant to be a joke. After waking from a recurring psychedelic dream, we meet with our girlfriend, Christine, and find out from her and other colleagues that the government official whom you were scheduled to ferry to inspect the surface of a prospective mining planet has gotten himself killed by operating comms during hyperjump. A real rookie mistake. What an idiot. Bits of him are supposedly strewn all over the room. The your tech friend Joe sneaks your code to get in to have a look because boys will be boys and who doesn't want to peek at the idiot mess he made. So you visit this room and actually discover a firearm under the console, strictly forbidden aboard except by security. Using a storage locker in a utility corridor, you can smuggle it by the guards for later. We also have a chat with Rainer Hofstedt. Physicist, a xenobiologist, and as the second government official on board, the only other person qualified to fill in for his departed colleague on the maiden voyage to the planet's surface. Since to say it's just a desolate rock, rich in mineral resources. Along the way, we also meet the cybernetic body of Ned, the ship AI, and Captain Brandt, who we won't see again for quite some time. Once you're ready, you embark on your voyage, and as you approach the planet, you begin to notice something strange. But your report is lost in transmission, and you crash into the planet. You've been Bermuda Triangled. Pew! As you escape the shuttle's wreckage, you find no desert planet, but a fantastically dense and colorful jungle, teeming with alien life. Rayner shouts a warning about the oxygen levels before the ship explodes. You awake to exotic feline beasts. Be beasts. You have been saved by the native alien species, the Iskai, descended from some sort of predatory mammal. The walls about you are constructed of fibrous green plants at the guild they call the Formers, the Jifad, shapes into buildings. They also create furniture, toilets, 
and the pride of every household, the fountain. You get a little tour. It's really nice. Your patrons are the Southwind Hunters Clan, and you are brought before a young Iskai, the chief, the Sabai, where you are asked for the highly prized medals of your ship in reward for their saving and caring for your life. You can do nothing with a broken ship and are, of course, grateful for your life, so you readily agree. And over the course of this discussion, you make some astonishing discoveries about the Iskai. They possess a large gland at the center of their heads, called a tree, which allows them to perform feats of apparent magic. Not only does it allow them to shape plants, like the Jifad Former's Guild, or cast seeming magic like the Jikas Mage's Guild. They are also capable of sharing thoughts and feelings between each other. We find out why the chief looks like a child, and it's that highly valued members of society can use the tree to transfer their soul into the body of a newborn child, granting effective immortality. Else the Iskai only lived some 30 years. This is tightly regulated by the council circle, and to break this edict is the vilest taboo as it necessitates the destruction of a child, or a child's personality, identity, ego. You are told an old cautionary tale, one of Argrim, the long-gone leader of the Former's Guild, who, after being refused permission, became obsessed with seeking immortality, conducting experiments that also warped and changed the former guild house, stamping his spirit upon the place. The haunted ruin outside the walls of the town is avoided to this day. Eventually, you are invited to attend a festival for a key, the current head of the Jafad, the former's guild, who shaped the plants with magic. Before the ceremony can begin, a masked human appears, shoots a projectile at a key, killing him instantly and escapes through a window. As you reel in shock that there might be native humans, you are told that in deference to their strange laws, as close as suspects by virtue of your species, you and Rainer along with Drea, the Iskai for Human Affairs, must work together to investigate the crime and bring the murderer to justice. You eventually track the human assassin to the head of the Mage's Guild, the Jakas, where the mage blinds the party, giving the human assassin time to escape. The mage is held while your party tracks the human to the haunted former guildhouse outside the city walls. Now the spookiness and interactivity of the dungeon is outstanding here. There are also glowing rainbow mushrooms, luciferous spores spread across the floor, walking plants, plants that only attack when you have your torch out, meat-eating plants that can be satisfied with hunks of meat. It all feels like a very fresh take on the crawling of dungeons. As an interesting note on the world building, the magical organ that the Iskai have the tree can also be found on the large predators you can fight in the jungles, the cron deer, suggesting a common ancestor. You can also get a sphere from the giant bug-like creatures, the waniac, which perhaps could be the vestigial prototypal form. Eventually you come to the heart of the dungeon and realise the Iskai mage haunting the place, Argrim, had turned himself into a dungeon heart from Dungeon Keeper, becoming the spirit of the place. A genius Loki, still alive and feeling through the senses of the local wildlife. The mind of the former guildhead is delighted in finally being able to interact with something more intelligent than the local predators. The human assassin's corpse is nearby, and the evidence ties it back to the current head of the Mages Guild. You race back to confront the owner, who attacks you, only to later reveal that Akir himself had asked him, his closest friend, to hire the assassin to spite a rival. This all seems kind of typical of Akir. The mage Sira joins you and the warrior Drea wants to accompany you a while longer. Tom accepts enthusiastically. I mean, why wouldn't he not let the cat people join? Otherwise, it's just him and the elderly dweeb. A seagoing vessel is arranged and you travel to the new landmass of Gratogel. Gratogel. Learning the language of its people on the voyage. As you approach land, Rainer remarks that the buildings resemble Celtic round huts. When you look to your stats, you have learnt the Celtic language. In order to gain passage to the next landmass to search for the Toronto, the chief of the village needs something from the local druids. Funnily enough, the druids also need something from you. The mute druid Melfas, 
accompanies you to find another druid missing deep in the dungeons who was exploring a forbidden area that once belonged to the exiled assassin druids, the Kengit Camulus, the group the dead human assassin had once belonged to. Along the way, Syra, the jig house mage, shares a moment with Malthas, and he finds that by touching her tree, he can share thoughts, something previously unheard of. Once you emerge from the dungeon, Malthas will accompany you, as not everyone would understand his uh, furry fever amongst the druids. He makes a decent support mage, and unlike Syra, his spells don't require seeds as a resource. On the next continent, you can prevent or fail to prevent an assassination of a counsellor in the town of Bellevino. The local druid has found out that the local Iskai shrine hides a bounty of valuable metals. The problem is, without the proper rituals, the planet reacts in violent ways. Just in time, evidence is presented and a war between the Celts and the Iskai is prevented. You meet the Jeek Hantos. The Illuminati comprised of Celts and Izkai and gain a follower with the ability to fast travel. You teleport to the desert town of Umajo, the only source of metal, as the miners there know the rituals to placate the goddess of the planet. With the help of a guide, you find your way to the Toronto, which is landed far in the desert. Something is wrong. Just as you think, maybe it's not another tired story about an exploitative corporation, you get a reminder, it always was. Despite the fact that you are standing in front of them dressed in chainmail, carrying an axe, the captain and AI claim you're delusional when you tell the crew the planet is full of sentient alien life, and they lock you up. Once you escape with the help of your friend Joe, you speak again to the Gicantos, and have to collect two magical pieces of knowledge to construct a seed powerful enough to stop the Toronto. Here the game starts to drag a little. You have to go into the Kengit Camulos' secret dungeon and after floor after floor after floor I ran out of rations that couldn't rest a heel. I barely got through with all my potions. After a slightly easier dungeon at the metal workers in Umajo, the seed is created by the Gicantos mages. You return to the Toronto once more. Here is where I really started to lose patience with the game's endless enemies, switches and puzzles, and just started to cheese everything. I made sure to bring rations, but you cannot rest anywhere in the Toronto, so you can rely only on potions. I lost heart when I looked up the guide and read this. Beware. Now you should press the switch on the plexiglass, which triggers many robots to battle. You will fight 106 service robots in 13 battles. Look, ain't nobody got time for that. These robots are spongy, numerous, and hit hard. I had no intention of either buying every potion in every town or grinding for hours just to fight them. I turned on developer mode and coasted through the endless enemies. Eventually, after fighting through the AI's numerous bodies, you reach the AI core. As expected, the party begins to be obliterated by the boss, I had had enough at that point and was about to break something nearby, but the scripted ending kicks in and the seed swallows up the ship. And that's Albion, which starts off so interesting and really good and turns into something so disappointingly repetitive and trite. Essentially, the larger plot is like that of Avatar and countless other media, And I realize for a specific type of person, this game is probably a big part of their childhood. I still really enjoy the first quarter of the game. And as you learn about the Iskai and their strange abilities, but the glacial pace of the rest of the game and sometimes the lack of clear direction prevents the game from being a true favorite. Regardless of anyone's commitment to old school sensibilities, the game is over 32 hours long and yet has no journal to remind you of your goals. It's truly disappointing in light of the manual's original foreword. 
Although its commitment to world building is laudable and is partially successful, I do think that it fails when it comes to its mechanics. I usually like to make some small comment on similar media or tropes, but in the world of video games, it isn't much quite like Albion. Dark Sun has an interesting setting and is party based, but is fundamentally of a more grimdark character. Morrowind had a novel setting and did deal with some colonialist themes, I suppose. Although other than being kind of weird, it bears little similarity. Wizardry 8 springs to mind, but I think it's fundamentally different in setting and story, although it's been quite some time since I played that one. Outside of the overdone trope of the exploitative corporations, as best exemplified by the movie Avatar, when I think of the best parts of Albion, I think of the initial setup the strange and interesting world, and the whole swashbuckling spirit. And it reminds me a lot of Jack Vance's awesome pulp novel series, the Planet Adventure series. One of my favourite book series of all time, it's a perfect blend of exotic world building, beautiful details, entertaining dialogue, and frenetic adventure. Jack Vance's books in general are way too underappreciated. Get the audiobook because he pronounces this as wonk. Verna Vingy's Fire Upon the Deep features a human ship crash-landed on a planet inhabited by a canine species who share it pack mines, amongst other things. On top of that, though, there's also a whole space opera storyline and a weirdness to the physics where proximity to the centre of the universe dictates mental and technological development of a culture. Fans of interesting world building should definitely check that one out. Finally, Albion describes a metaphysics of order versus chaos with the Toronto described as a return of the ancestral foe, Rome, trying to constrain magic with logic. This bears some similarity to the metaphysics of the World of Darkness setting, in Werewolf represented in the timeless battle of nature versus technology, or the weaver versus the worm, or another World of Darkness setting, Mage the Ascension in the traditions fight with technocracy, Although the war between order and chaos is a story as old as humanity, represented throughout numerous real-world creation myths. Let's move on to the mechanics. Albion uses an interesting blend of different RPG genre perspectives and mechanics. There's a zoomed-out overworld mode, a more zoomed-in indoors mode for most of the dialogue, a first-person perspective dungeon-crawling mode for dungeons in certain towns, and a turn-based tactical mode. Functionally, this succeeds, as in the overworld you will be farming monsters and have a larger field of view and can easily dictate when to initiate the encounter, whereas in dungeon, the first-person perspective means limited visibility and you can more easily be surprised. In some ways, this blend of perspectives feels like an homage to RPGs in general, but it harks back to the core development team's previous game, Amberstar, which did much the same thing. As an RPG, Albion's mechanics are not particularly deep. There are pleasures to be found in leveling up and gaining an extra attack or finding an excellent combination of two weapons to go in your Izkai warrior's hands and tail. But outside of that, the best joys of Albion are really just exploring the world, either through one of its numerous perspectives or by its excellent dialogue system. Despite all my criticism for Albion, this dialogue system is probably one of my favourites in all of games, giving you important or plot-related topics at the top in yellow, common questions about the character's background, then an expanding keyword query, and even a free text. Initially, when you crash, the world is so interesting that you want to spend some time here maneuvering around the conversation like a Wikipedia addict. Unfortunately, choice and consequence playing a major part in dialogue wouldn't really be a thing for a few years yet, so don't expect much there. And the interesting background gives way to tedious dungeons, puzzles, and fetch quests. Unfortunately, the combat system does not feel very tactical, particularly early on, when you don't have many options. Spells are very effective, but because you can only move around the first two rows at one square per turn, and there are no attacks of opportunity for enemies moving in front of your characters or away from your characters, 
You can feel helpless trying to stop your fragile mages from being attacked, particularly before you complete your party and level up. There are, however, a lot of concessions given to the player. Rummaging in your inventory and healing in the middle of combat is a free action and a party member with zero health will heal when next you rest. No resource or resurrection spell or trip to town required. More tactical opportunities open up later in the game but will generally revolve around magically freezing all enemies so they can't attack. The need to do these sorts of things over and over again eventually gets very grating. Another criticism is that you are encouraged to do a lot of grinding to remain competitive. This is even recommended in the walkthrough I was reading, although this harks back to the original mission statement in the manual in regard to the hallmark of good RPGs being starting with initially weak characters. I feel this misses the mark a lot. There are ways to make our party feel underpowered without consigning them to fight the same encounters for hours. A smarter game would have all party characters across the world level at the same time as well. Instead, you are given characters at level 9 when your main is at level 20. It tends to feel like a massive waste of time. One of the many egregious insults of the game is the weapon durability, which feels completely random. If something breaks, it's usually less frustrating to just reload the game. It might never break again. Money also has weight, which means you can potentially sell yourself into being too encumbered to move from the weight of your gold. A lot of these issues could have been noticed in playtesting, but I feel the devs belong to an old school that emphasized keeping these things in the service of RPG simulation over play experience. As an example, there's one moment where I had to warn a character about an assassination by manually typing assassination into an ask field, like a goddamn text adventure. That's a, that's a wild expectation to have of the player for a mechanic that would otherwise be optional for the rest of the game. For its time, Albion's graphics look good, and its sprites are very detailed and nicely animated. I do think the jungle looks gorgeous in particular, and the uh, conical and brightly coloured trees are a real treat. I like that. By the same token, there's something extremely satisfying with the sound you hear when a weapon hits in Albion's battles. It's like Excalibur slicing a lettuce. Why do I love this sound so much? There's not much else to say on the sound really. In fact, sometimes there's some downright failures. Like when I cast the hurry spell, I just get what sounds like a system beep. There are also these ambient loops, but sometimes the loops are so aggressive that they become grating. I feel like ambient sound in general around 1995 would not have been particularly common though, which makes me feel like not going too hard on it. Music is okay too, but not anything that's really going at the retro game radio playlist. It's kind of charming sometimes though. Albion reviewed reasonably well in its time. Honestly, I do feel like I'm shitting on someone's childhood with my critique, and especially the efforts of the development team, but I, uh, I just have different expectations, and those people are probably Germans. The game is available on GOG, and there is currently a GitHub project to remaster the game. From what I've seen, the gorgeous artwork really does still look amazing. Unfortunately, I can't fully recommend Albion. Although it is a game not without its redeeming qualities, held back by dated design elements. Maybe just play it up to the first landmass, then try to imagine the rest of a much better game with a less cliché plot. That first quarter of the game made me want to swallow the rest, but rapidly it became a harder pill to swallow. Try at your discretion.